In this video, we will delve into the detailed anatomy of the middle ear, a fascinating and complex part of the human auditory system. We will begin with an overview of the middle ear, then we will examine the three main components of the middle ear, the tympanic cavity, the eustachian tube, and the mastoid air cells. We'll also cover the role of the mastoid air cells, located in the mastoid process of the temporal bone. Next, we will detail the blood and nerve supply of the middle ear. Furthermore, we will discuss how pathologies affecting the middle ear, such as otitis media, can have significant impacts on hearing and overall health. Lastly, we will conclude with key takeaways. The middle ear, a pivotal component of the auditory system, is strategically situated within the temporal bone, bridging the gap between the external ear and the inner ear. It starts at the tympanic membrane, commonly known as the eardrum, and extends up to the lateral wall of the inner ear. This region is primarily defined by the tympanic cavity, a meticulously structured space that serves as the residence for the three auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes. These tiny, yet remarkably significant bones play a vital role in the auditory mechanism. They are responsible for efficiently transmitting sound vibrations from the eardrum to the inner ear, enabling the process of hearing. Anatomically, the tympanic cavity is connected to the pharynx through the eustachian tube, situated anteriorly. On the posterior aspect, the tympanic cavity is associated with the mastoid cells, integral parts of the mastoid process of the skull. Moreover, the entire cavity is meticulously lined with a mucous membrane. This lining ensures the smooth movement of the ossicles and assists in defending against infections, thus preserving the integrity and functionality of this intricate and vital auditory component. The harmonious interplay of these structures within the middle ear is fundamental for the effective conduction of sound. The tympanic cavity is a crucial anatomical feature, forming the central chamber of the middle ear. It is situated medially to the tympanic membrane, often referred to as the eardrum, and plays a pivotal role in the auditory process. One of its most distinctive characteristics is its biconcave disc-like shape, which is anatomically designed to accommodate and protect the delicate structures within. Central to the function of the tympanic cavity is its role in housing the three small auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes. These bones are not only minuscule in size but also remarkable in their precision alignment. This alignment is critical as it allows the ossicles to function synergistically in amplifying sound waves. They act as a bridge to convey these vibrations from the tympanic membrane, which captures sound from the external environment, to the oval window of the inner ear. This transfer is a key step in the process of converting sound waves into electrical signals that can be interpreted by the brain as sound. Moreover, the structural integrity of the tympanic cavity is provided by its six walls. These walls are not just mere barriers, they are intricately designed to provide support and protection to the inner workings of the middle ear. Each wall has its specific role and relevance, contributing to the overall functionality of the tympanic cavity. They ensure that the ossicles are held in the perfect position to perform their critical task of sound transmission, safeguarding the efficiency and effectiveness of this vital sensory process. The lateral or tympanic wall of the tympanic cavity is an essential component in the anatomy of the middle ear. This wall is primarily formed by the tympanic membrane, which acts as the critical interface between the external auditory canal and the middle ear. The tympanic membrane is noteworthy for its unique structural composition and functional role in sound transmission. One of the distinguishing features along the lateral wall is the prominent ridge created by the chorda tympani. This nerve, a branch of the facial nerve, courses through the middle ear, lying between two distinct parts of the tympanic membrane, the pars tensor and the pars flaccida. The pars tensor forms the tense, larger lower portion of the membrane, comprising the majority of its surface area. It is this part of the tympanic membrane that is primarily responsible for receiving and transmitting sound vibrations to the ossicles. In contrast, the pars flaccida, located in the smaller, slack upper section of the tympanic membrane, is less taut and plays a lesser role in sound conduction. Additionally, the upper part of the lateral wall is not merely membranous but also includes a bony structure that forms the lateral wall of the epitympanic recess. The epitympanic recess, an upper extension of the tympanic cavity, houses additional important structures of the middle ear, including part of the malleus and incus bones. This bony portion of the lateral wall provides structural integrity and protection to these delicate ossicles, ensuring their proper positioning and functioning within the cavity. 
the lateral or tympanic wall of the tympanic cavity offers vital insights into the health and functioning of the middle ear when examined through otoscopy. Otoscopy, a standard procedure in otolaryngology and primary care, involves the use of an otoscope to visually inspect the tympanic membrane and the adjacent structures. This examination reveals several key features that are essential in assessing ear health and diagnosing various conditions. One of the most prominent features observed during an otoscopic examination is the handle, or manubrium, of the malleus. This bone, one of the three auditory ossicles, is closely adherent to the inner surface of the tympanic membrane. The manubrium's visibility through the tympanic membrane is a crucial indicator of the membrane's integrity and the middle ear's overall status. It appears as a distinct linear structure, providing a reference point for orienting other anatomical landmarks within the tympanic cavity. Another significant feature visible during otoscopy is the umbo, which is the most inward point of the tympanic membrane. It marks the point where the tip of the malleus handle is attached, creating a slight inward depression on the membrane surface. The position and appearance of the umbo can offer important clues about the tympanic membrane's tension and the potential presence of fluid or negative pressure in the middle ear. Additionally, the cone of light is a key observation during otoscopic examination. This is a reflection of light from the otoscope that appears as a triangular bright spot on the tympanic membrane. The cone of light typically emanates from the umbo and is directed anteroinferiorly. Its presence and orientation are important in assessing the tympanic membrane's health and position. A normal cone of light is indicative of a healthy, properly positioned tympanic membrane, while deviations can signify abnormalities such as fluid accumulation or perforation. Together, these observations, the prominence of the malleus handle, the umbo, and the cone of light, provide essential diagnostic information during an otoscopic examination. The medial or labyrinthine wall of the tympanic cavity plays a pivotal role in the auditory system. This wall is distinguished by several key anatomical landmarks, each contributing to the complex functionality and integrity of the ear. At the heart of these landmarks is the promontory, a notable feature of the medial wall. The promontory is a bony protrusion that is actually part of the inner ear, formed by the basal turn of the cochlea. It bulges into the tympanic cavity, offering a tangible representation of the close relationship between the middle and inner ears. Above and behind the promontory lies the vestibular window, commonly referred to as the oval window. This crucial structure is where the stapes, the smallest bone in the human body, connects the middle ear to the inner ear. The oval window acts as a portal through which vibrations from the middle ear ossicles are transmitted to the fluid-filled cochlea, initiating the process of hearing at the sensory level. Situated below and slightly behind the promontory is the cochlear window, also known as the round window. This membrane-covered opening serves as a pressure release valve for the fluid movements within the cochlea, ensuring that the fluid can move freely as sound waves are transmitted through the oval window. The medial wall also features the tympanic segment of the facial canal, which is visible above and behind the oval window. This segment of the facial canal carries the facial nerve as it traverses through the ear. Lastly, positioned above the segment of the facial canal is the prominence of the lateral semicircular canal. This structure is part of the vestibular system of the inner ear, which is responsible for maintaining balance and spatial orientation. The posterior or mastoid wall of the tympanic cavity is characterized by several key features. At the superior part of this wall lies the aditus to the mastoid antrum, a crucial connection between the middle ear and the mastoid air cells in the temporal bone. This pathway is essential for air circulation and drainage within the middle ear system. Along the medial part of the posterior wall runs the facial nerve within its bony enclosure, the facial canal. This positioning of the facial nerve is critical as it navigates through the ear, highlighting the close relationship between auditory and facial nerve structures. Another important feature on the posterior wall is the pyramidal process, a small but significant bony projection. This structure serves as the origin point for the stapedius muscle, one of the two tiny muscles in the middle ear. The role of the stapedius muscle, which attaches to the stapes bone, is to dampen the vibrations of the stapes, thereby protecting the inner ear from excessively loud noises. The chorda tympani, a branch of the facial nerve, also makes its presence known on this wall. It emerges from the facial canal through the posterior canaliculus, indicating the complex routing of nerves within the middle ear. On the other hand, the anterior or carotid wall of the tympanic cavity has its own distinct characteristics. 
This wall is positioned adjacent to the internal carotid artery as it courses through the carotid canal. The proximity of these two structures underscores the intricate anatomy of the ear and its neighboring vascular systems. In the upper part of this wall, one finds the posterior opening of the eustachian tube. Also located within the anterior wall is the canal for the tensor tympani muscle. This muscle, like the stapedius, is integral to the functioning of the middle ear. It attaches to the malleus and acts to tense the tympanic membrane, helping to modulate sound transmission and protect the inner ear from damage due to loud sounds. The superior or tegmental wall of the tympanic cavity is formed by the tegmen tympani, which is a thin plate of bone that is part of the petrous portion of the temporal bone. The role and positioning of the tegmen tympani are crucial, as it serves as a protective barrier, separating the tympanic cavity from critical structures within the cranial vault. One of the primary functions of the tegmen tympani is to provide a separation between the tympanic cavity and the dura mater, the tough outer membrane covering the brain. This separation is essential for the protection of the central nervous system. It ensures that infections or other pathologies within the middle ear do not easily spread to the brain. Additionally, the tegmen tympani also separates the tympanic cavity from the middle cranial fossa. This positioning highlights the close anatomical relationship between the ear and the central nervous system. Near the superior wall of the tympanic cavity lies the petrosquamous suture. This suture is an important anatomical landmark formed at the junction between the petrous and squamous parts of the temporal bone. The petrous part, which houses the structures of the inner ear, is known for its hardness and density, providing a sturdy housing for these delicate structures. In contrast, the squamous part is relatively thin and forms a large portion of the side of the skull. The petrosquamous suture, therefore, represents the junction of these two distinct parts of the temporal bone, each contributing to the protection and functionality of the ear. The inferior or jugular wall of the tympanic cavity is primarily formed by the jugular fossa, a significant depression in the temporal bone. The jugular fossa plays a crucial role as it separates the middle ear from the internal jugular vein. The jugular wall's primary function is to provide a protective barrier between the delicate structures of the middle ear and the significant vascular structures of the neck. This separation is crucial for preventing the spread of infections or diseases from the ear to the vascular system, and vice versa. The tympanic cavity houses one of the most intricate and crucial elements of the auditory system, the auditory ossicles. These three small bones, namely the malleus, incus, and stapes, uniquely designed and precisely positioned to play a pivotal role in the process of hearing. The malleus, also known as the hammer, is the first of these ossicles and is directly attached to the inner surface of the tympanic membrane. Its structure resembles a hammer or a club, and it acts as the initial mechanical interface for sound vibrations entering the ear. When sound waves strike the tympanic membrane, they cause it to vibrate, and these vibrations are then transferred to the malleus. The second bone in this auditory chain is the incus or the anvil. The incus articulates with the malleus at one end and the stapes at the other, serving as a critical link in the transmission of sound vibrations. The unique shape of the incus allows it to efficiently relay these vibrations from the malleus to the stapes, ensuring a precise transfer of mechanical energy. Finally, the stapes, the smallest bone in the human body, also known as the stirrup due to its shape, completes the chain of auditory ossicles. The stape sits in the oval window, a membrane-covered opening to the inner ear. The vibrations transmitted to the stapes are then conveyed into the inner ear, specifically to the fluid-filled cochlea. This transfer is vital for converting the mechanical energy of sound waves into the neural impulses that the brain interprets as sound. These bones are among the smallest in the human body, yet their role in the process of hearing is immense. They work in a precise and coordinated manner to amplify and transmit sound vibrations from the external environment to the inner ear with remarkable efficiency. Each of the auditory ossicles, namely the malleus, incus, and stapes, is distinctively structured and divided into several parts, each playing a specific role in the process of sound transmission. The malleus, the outermost of the three ossicles, connects directly to the tympanic membrane and is divided into three parts, the head, the neck, and the handle, or manubrium. The head of the malleus is the uppermost part, engaging in a joint with the incus. The neck is a narrowed segment just below the head, leading to the handle. The handle extends downwards and is firmly attached to the tympanic membrane. 
When sound waves cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate, these vibrations are first received by the handle of the malleus. The incus, situated between the malleus and stapes, comprises the body, long limb, and short limb. The body of the incus articulates with the head of the malleus, forming a pivotal connection. The long limb of the incus extends from the body and articulates at its end with the stapes. This long limb acts as a lever, transmitting vibrations from the malleus to the stapes. The short limb, although smaller, provides an anchoring point for the incus to the walls of the tympanic cavity. The stapes, the smallest and most internal of the ossicles, consists of the head, anterior and posterior processes, or crura, and a base or footplate. The head of the stapes connects to the incus, receiving vibrations that have been transmitted through the malleus and incus. The anterior and posterior crura, slender arch-like structures, extend from the head to the base. The base, or footplate, fits into the oval window of the inner ear. When the stapes vibrates, it causes the footplate to move in and out of the oval window, transmitting the vibrations into the fluid-filled cochlea of the inner ear, a crucial step in the conversion of these vibrations into neural signals for hearing. The tympanic cavity not only houses the auditory ossicles, but also contains several specialized joints that facilitate the transmission of sound vibrations. These joints are essential for the articulation and movement of the ossicles, ensuring efficient sound conduction from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. Each joint has a distinct role and contributes to the overall functionality of the auditory system. The incudomaleolar joint is a pivotal connection between the malleus and the incus. This joint is a saddle-type synovial joint, allowing for the necessary mobility between these two bones. The movement at the incudomaleolar joint is crucial for transmitting vibrations from the tympanic membrane, via the malleus, to the incus. Next is the incudostapedial joint, which joins the incus to the stapes. This joint is unique, as it is a ball and socket type, providing a secure yet flexible connection between these ossicles. The incudostapedial joint plays a critical role in transferring vibrations from the incus to the stapes. The flexibility of this joint allows for fine-tuned movements of the stapes, which is crucial for accurately conveying sound vibrations to the oval window of the inner ear. The stapedio-vestibular joint, also known as the oval window joint, is where the base, or footplate, of the stapes connects to the oval window. This joint is not a typical synovial joint but a fibrous joint, allowing for the transmission of vibrations from the stapes to the fluid of the cochlea. The effectiveness of this joint is vital for the conversion of mechanical sound vibrations into hydraulic waves within the cochlea. Lastly, the tympanostapedial syndesmosis is a fibrous joint that connects the tympanic membrane to the head of the stapes. This connection is less of a traditional joint and more of a fibrous continuity, providing additional stability to the position of the stapes in relation to the tympanic membrane. Additionally, the tympanic cavity contains a network of specialized ligaments. These ligaments are integral to the ear's auditory function. Their primary function is to ensure that the auditory ossicles remain correctly aligned and stable, a necessity for efficient sound transmission. The acicular chain, comprising the malleus, incus, and stapes, is held in place by two main anchoring elements. Externally, the tympanic membrane provides support to the malleus, which is directly attached to it. Internally, the annular ligament surrounds the base or footplate of the stapes, anchoring it to the oval window of the inner ear. This connection is essential for transmitting sound vibrations from the ossicles into the inner ear. In addition to these primary supports, there are several other important ligaments within the tympanic cavity. The superior or suspensory malleolar ligament, as its name suggests, provides superior support to the malleus. This ligament aids in suspending the malleus and maintaining its alignment within the tympanic cavity. The lateral malleolar ligament and the anterior malleolar ligament provide lateral and anterior support, respectively, to the malleus. These ligaments help maintain the position of the malleus relative to the tympanic membrane and the rest of the acicular chain. Furthermore, the posterior incutal ligament and superior incutal ligament are responsible for securing the incus. The posterior incutal ligament stabilizes the incus from the back, while the superior incutal ligament provides support from above. Within the tympanic cavity reside two small but remarkably significant muscles, the tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius muscle. These muscles, though diminutive in size, play a crucial role in the movement and function of the ossicles, thereby contributing significantly to the auditory process. 
the tensor tympani muscle is attached to the malleus, one of the three auditory ossicles. This muscle originates from the walls of the eustachian tube and the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, and its tendon attaches to the handle of the malleus. When the tensor tympani muscle contracts, it pulls on the malleus, causing the tympanic membrane to tense. This action dampens the vibrations of the tympanic membrane, particularly in response to loud noises. Such a mechanism helps protect the inner ear from potential damage caused by excessively loud sounds. The stapedius muscle, the smallest skeletal muscle in the human body, is connected to the stapes. Its tendon attaches to the neck of the stapes, and the muscle itself is anchored in the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity. The primary function of the stapedius muscle is to control the movement of the stapes within the oval window. When this muscle contracts, it stabilizes the stapes, reducing its amplitude of movement. This action is crucial for preventing the transmission of overly vigorous vibrations to the inner ear, especially during exposure to high-intensity sounds. By doing so, the stapedius muscle plays a vital role in protecting the inner ear from noise-induced trauma and contributes to the fine-tuning of sound perception. Together, the tensor tympani and stapedius muscles contribute significantly to the acoustic reflex, an involuntary reflex that limits the transmission of loud sounds to the inner ear, thereby protecting it from damage. The tympanic cavity is lined with a mucous membrane that plays a vital role in maintaining the health and functionality of the ear. This mucous membrane is a continuation of the mucosal lining of the upper respiratory tract, highlighting the interconnected nature of the ear, nose, and throat regions in the human body. The mucous membrane of the tympanic cavity is composed of a thin layer of ciliate epithelial cells. These cilia are small, hair-like structures that have a significant role in the ear's health. They help to move mucus and any trapped debris out of the ear, towards the nasopharynx. Interspersed within this epithelial layer are mucus-secreting glands. These glands produce a small but critical amount of mucus. The mucus secreted by these glands has several important functions. Firstly, it helps to keep the cavity moist, which is essential for the proper functioning of the cilia. Moisture is crucial in this environment as it ensures the cilia can move smoothly and effectively. Secondly, the mucus provides lubrication to the middle ear, particularly to the ossicles and the joints between them. This lubrication is important for the smooth movement of these bones as they transmit sound vibrations. Moreover, the mucus membrane plays a protective role. It helps to defend the middle ear against pathogens, trapping and removing them before they can cause infections. The continuous movement of mucus, facilitated by the cilia, ensures that any trapped pathogens are efficiently expelled from the middle ear. The eustachian tube, also known as the pharyngotympanic or auditory tube, plays a crucial role in the functioning of the middle ear and overall ear health. This anatomical structure is a bony and cartilaginous channel that establishes a vital connection between the tympanic cavity and the nasopharynx, the upper part of the throat behind the nose. The eustachian tube's primary function is to equalize the air pressure in the middle ear with that of the external atmosphere, which is essential for proper hearing. The tube extends from the anterior wall of the middle ear to the lateral wall of the nasopharynx, aligning approximately with the level of the inferior nasal concha. This strategic positioning allows for the effective regulation of air pressure and drainage of any fluids from the middle ear into the throat, where they can be harmlessly swallowed or expelled. The eustachian tube is comprised of two distinct portions, the posterior portion, which is osseous bony, and the anterior portion, which is primarily cartilaginous and fibrous. The osseous portion forms the proximal one-third of the tube, closest to the middle ear, and is embedded in the temporal bone. This bony section provides structural rigidity and stability to the tube. The cartilaginous and fibrous portion forms the distal two-thirds of the eustachian tube. This section is more flexible, allowing the tube to open and close as necessary. The cartilaginous part is critical for the tube's function, it is typically closed at rest to prevent the continuous flow of air and potential pathogens from the nasopharynx to the middle ear. However, it opens during activities like swallowing, yawning, or chewing, allowing for the equalization of pressure and drainage. Dysfunction of the eustachian tube, such as blockage or inability to open properly, can lead to various ear problems, including middle ear infections, otitis media, fluid accumulation, and difficulties in hearing due to pressure imbalances. The mastoid air cells are a network of pneumatic cavities located within the mastoid process of the temporal bone. 
These air cells are intricately linked to the middle ear, contributing to the ear's health and its ability to process sound. Situated in the posterior portion of the temporal bone, the mastoid air cells vary in size and number among individuals. They are part of a larger cavity system known as the mastoid antrum, which serves as a central chamber within the mastoid process. The mastoid antrum is significant because it acts as a hub, facilitating communication and airflow between the mastoid air cells and the middle ear. The connection between the mastoid antrum and the middle ear is established through a passage called the aditus ad antrum. This passageway is crucial as it allows for the continuous exchange of air between these structures, helping to maintain equal air pressure in the middle ear. This pressure equalization is essential for the proper functioning of the tympanic membrane and the ossicles within the middle ear, as it ensures that they can vibrate freely and effectively in response to sound waves. The presence of the mastoid air cells and their connection to the middle ear via the mastoid antrum and the aditus ad antrum also play a role in the drainage and ventilation of the middle ear. This is particularly important in preventing the accumulation of fluids in the middle ear, which can lead to infections and other ear pathologies. Furthermore, the mastoid air cells provide a certain degree of protection to the delicate structures of the inner ear. The pneumatic nature of these cells offers a buffer against physical impacts, and their positioning in the skull helps distribute and dampen external forces that might otherwise cause damage. The arterial supply to the middle ear is primarily provided by branches of the external carotid artery, each serving different parts of the middle ear and contributing to its overall health and functionality. The posterior tympanic artery, a branch of the external carotid artery, is one of the key arteries involved in supplying blood to the middle ear. This artery specifically provides blood to the tympanic cavity and its structures, playing a crucial role in maintaining the health of the tympanic membrane and the auditory ossicles. Another significant artery is the anterior tympanic artery, which is a branch of the maxillary artery. This artery contributes to the blood supply of the anterior region of the middle ear, supporting the tissues in this area, including parts of the eustachian tube and the anterior structures of the tympanic cavity. The superior tympanic artery, a branch of the middle meningeal artery, also plays a vital role. It supplies blood to the upper part of the tympanic cavity, ensuring that the superior structures, including the superior part of the tympanic membrane and the upper ossicles, receive adequate blood flow. Additionally, the inferior tympanic artery, a branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery, provides blood to the lower regions of the middle ear. This includes supplying blood to the inferior parts of the tympanic cavity and contributing to the vascularization of the lower auditory ossicles. The stylomastoid artery, which can be a branch of either the posterior auricular or occipital arteries, supplies the area around the stylomastoid foramen, including the facial nerve as it exits the temporal bone, and parts of the middle ear. Venous drainage from the middle ear is equally important for the removal of deoxygenated blood and metabolic waste. The veins from the middle ear primarily drain into two systems, the pterygoid venous plexus and the superior petrosal sinus. The pterygoid venous plexus, located in the region of the pharynx, facilitates venous return from the anterior part of the ear, while the superior petrosal sinus, a dural venous sinus of the brain, handles drainage from the superior aspects of the middle ear. The lymphatic drainage of the middle ear is an essential aspect of its anatomy and physiology, playing a crucial role in immune defense and the maintenance of fluid balance. Lymph drainage from the middle ear occurs through a network of lymphatic vessels that connect to specific lymph nodes, which are instrumental in filtering lymphatic fluid and trapping pathogens. The primary lymph nodes involved in the drainage of lymph from the middle ear are the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, the parotid lymph nodes, and the upper group of the deep cervical nodes. The retropharyngeal lymph nodes, located posterior to the pharynx, receive lymph from the tissues of the middle ear. These nodes are strategically positioned to filter lymphatic fluid from the ear and surrounding pharyngeal structures, playing a role in the body's immune response to infections that may affect the middle ear, such as otitis media. The parotid lymph nodes, situated near the parotid gland, also contribute to the lymphatic drainage of the middle ear. Given their location near the external auditory canal and the outer portions of the middle ear, these nodes are crucial for draining lymph from these areas. Additionally, the upper group of the deep cervical nodes, located along the internal jugular vein, plays a significant role in lymphatic drainage. 
These deep cervical nodes are part of a major lymphatic pathway in the neck, and their involvement in draining lymph from the middle ear underscores the interconnectedness of the ear with other head and neck structures. The nerve supply to the middle ear is a complex and vital aspect of its functionality. This nerve supply is predominantly derived from the tympanic plexus, a network of nerves located on the promontory of the middle ear cavity. The tympanic plexus is primarily formed by the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. This nerve branch plays a key role in providing sensory innovation to the middle ear. It is responsible for transmitting sensations such as pain, pressure, and temperature from the middle ear to the brain, which is essential for detecting changes or abnormalities within the ear. In addition to the glossopharyngeal nerve, the tympanic plexus also receives sympathetic fibers from the internal carotid nerve. These sympathetic fibers are part of the autonomic nervous system and contribute to the regulation of blood flow and other involuntary responses in the middle ear. Moreover, the middle ear receives additional nerve supply from branches of several other cranial nerves. The trigeminal nerve, particularly its mandibular branch, provides sensory innovation to the anterior and inferior regions of the ear. The facial nerve is involved in innervating the muscles of the middle ear, such as the stapedius muscle. The glossopharyngeal nerve, as mentioned earlier, contributes significantly to the tympanic plexus while the vagus nerve also provides some innovation to the ear, particularly in the region of the auditory canal and the external surface of the tympanic membrane. Together, these nerves ensure comprehensive sensory coverage and functional control of the middle ear. They facilitate the detection of various stimuli, regulate the ear's response to sound, and contribute to the maintenance of the ear's internal environment. Acute otitis media and chronic otitis media are two prevalent clinical conditions associated with the middle ear, each with distinct characteristics and implications for ear health. Acute otitis media is a rapid onset infection of the middle ear typically seen in children but can also affect adults. It is often precipitated by upper respiratory infections leading to the blockage of the eustachian tube. This blockage creates a fluid-filled environment in the middle ear, which can become infected by bacteria or viruses. The hallmark symptoms of include ear pain, otalgia, a feeling of fullness or pressure, hearing loss, fever, and sometimes otorrhea, discharge from the ear, if the tympanic membrane ruptures. In children, it can also present with irritability and feeding difficulties. Prompt and effective treatment is crucial to prevent complications such as hearing loss or the spread of infection to nearby structures. Chronic otitis media, on the other hand, is a long-standing infection of the middle ear that can lead to persistent or recurring symptoms and can potentially cause more significant damage. It may develop after repeated episodes of acute otitis media or due to continuous eustachian tube dysfunction. It is characterized by persistent inflammation of the middle ear, with symptoms that can include persistent ear discharge, otorrhea, hearing loss, and sometimes tinnitus. One of the major concerns with chronic otitis media is its potential to cause permanent damage to the structures of the middle ear, such as the tympanic membrane and ossicles, leading to chronic hearing loss. In severe cases, it can also lead to more serious complications like mastoiditis, cholesteatoma formation, or even spread of the infection to the inner ear or brain. In conclusion, the middle ear, an intricate and vital component of the human auditory system, is strategically located within the temporal bone, nestled between the external ear and the inner ear. The middle ear comprises three main parts, the tympanic cavity, the eustachian tube, and the mastoid air cells. Each of these components plays a distinct and crucial role in auditory function. The tympanic cavity is the central chamber where the three auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes, reside. These ossicles are pivotal in transmitting sound vibrations from the tympanic membrane, or eardrum, to the inner ear. Their movement and coordination are essential for converting sound waves into mechanical vibrations that can be processed by the inner ear. The eustachian tube, extending from the middle ear to the nasopharynx, serves as a critical pressure-regulating system. It equalizes the air pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane and facilitates drainage of any fluid from the middle ear. This function is vital not only for maintaining the tympanic membrane's flexibility but also for preventing middle ear infections. The mastoid air cells, located within the mastoid process of the temporal bone, play a role in air pressure regulation and immune defense. These cells are connected to the middle ear and contribute to the overall health of the ear, especially in terms of preventing and managing infections. 
Pathologies affecting the middle ear, such as acute and chronic otitis media, can significantly impact hearing and overall health. These conditions, characterized by inflammation and infection, can lead to pain, hearing loss, and in severe cases, more serious complications. Their management is crucial in preserving ear function and preventing long-term adverse effects.